podcast in the United States and good evening and good afternoon for the rest. Um, welcome to our social inclusion webinar series. In this series, we are dealing with um, one of the most crucial factors in our pursue, pursuing the sustainable development goals and also the twin goals that the World Bank has uh, declared as, as their anchor, as mm -hmm. our anchor for all our operations of eliminating poverty and shared prosperity. So social inclusion is right there in the shared prosperity goal. And as we all know, also on the sustainable development goals. Mm -hmm. So um, social inclusion um, for, for us is, is um, deals a lot with identity. With, and a lot of exclusion that groups face is based is identity based exclusion. It's based on who people are, whether uh, this is a religious identity or an ethnic identity. And today we're going to talk about one of the most challenging identities I think to deal uh, from a development perspective. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have made some progress in terms of gender identity and gender equality and inclusion in development, including women in development. But now we're faced with new challenges regarding exclusion based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Mm -hmm. And um, and again, this is a tough one from an economic development perspective. We are trying to improve our framing on this issue. And more importantly, we're trying to learn what to do about it. What can we do uh, as policymakers, as academics, as a development community, so that we can really truly include LGBTI populations into the whole development process. And today I'm delighted to have with me, here with me Chloe Schwenke, Professor Schwenke, who uh, is, I think, one of the pioneers in terms of making precisely this link between LGBTI exclusion and development. So she uh, has done research and um, conducted a lot of work, both from the human rights perspective, but more importantly, also from the programming perspective. Chloe is an adjunct professor at the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. Uh, she was vice president for global programs at Freedom House in Washington, D.C., and also has served as advisor for the USAID, uh, United States Agency for International Development, on both LGBTI issues, but also um, for the Africa desk, also on uh, more generally democracy, human rights, etc. Welcome, Chloe, and we're looking forward to your presentation. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here, um, particularly on a topic that right now is very much in a lot of people's minds. Um, in some ways, uh, that's a good thing. In other ways, it's a very controversial thing. And hopefully, today we'll have a chance to illuminate a little bit what we're talking about in the terms of development and the inclusion of LGBTI people in that context. The most obvious question, of course, comes up right away is, why are we having this conversation? Why is this an important conversation to have? And I would think it's an appropriate way to frame this, to think about what the World Bank president himself said, which goes to the heart of what this issue is about. This is an issue of discrimination. And when it comes to discrimination, there is a fairly strong consensus that discrimination is wrong, full stop, period. <laughs> And what it then becomes a challenge of deciding where and how discrimination is making itself manifest in the world, and particularly in the context of development. And here we can see that among those that are most discriminated against are LGBTI people. They're not alone, persons with disabilities, and there's other groups as well that experience this kind of discrimination. But it's a, it's, it's a very clear not, you know, common knowledge right now that LGBTI people are often the ones most left out in terms of development. The bank is here to eliminate, or at least make significant progress in the elimination of poverty. And one of the most clear cause and effect relationships is between exclusion and discrimination and poverty. And those who are affected by this level of discrimination are the ones that are we call marginalized populations. And those people are essentially trapped in poverty. This is the population that we're talking about today, LGBTI people. Poverty, of course, is more than just money. This is There's many, many different dimensions to poverty. And poverty and, and exclusion go hand in hand. Poverty, of course, is economic. But it's also political. It's also cultural. Poverty takes the form of people not being able to access services such as education, <clears throat> such as health, such as access to jobs. 
Um, in this case and for this population, it's even more intense because often the exclusion and the poverty come from being thrown out of your very family institution itself. Um, you're thrown out from community structures, from even faith communities. Accompanying all of this is a profound sense of stigmatization. And I'm really, it's really hard, given all of that, that people can find any sense of hope. So when all of this happens, you're finding people that are starting to internalize this. And that's the most damaging of all. There's some very deep psychological wounds when people start to internalize that level of discrimination. LGBTI, that's a, that's a mouthful. And there's even more letters that some people add, Q for, for clear or for questioning, and there's, there's more. But the general consensus right now is to use the five letters, LGBTI, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex. We often lump these together, and that has its value, but it also gets confusing, because each one of these populations has its own particular dimensions and, and characteristics and development needs. So we'll be talking about both we'll be, today. We'll be talking about the, the needs that are shared across this community, but in some cases I'll be calling out specific needs of, of the separate letters. So that's an important thing to, to keep in mind. There is one common thread though between all of this, and that is the question of security, safety, the ability to stay alive. And that sounds perhaps overly dramatic, but that's where we're at in many cases. LGBTI people are so embattled and so beleaguered in many situations that they are struggling to simply stay in a safe spot, in a safe place. The other dimension that comes up a lot amongst different cultures and concerns when you start talking about sexual orientation and gender identity is the whole question of values. Every culture takes its own position on this, and we have a lot of discourse back and forth, some of it very heated when it comes to this conversation. Uh, many cultures simply don't accept this as an acceptable way of being. And all I can say in that context is the, what we all know, and, and hopefully most of us are committed to, and that is that human dignity is universal. And we've made some significant progress worldwide on human rights itself, and we have a, a structure in place on human rights that are really important that we, we do not lose that commitment to that. So I'm going to come back to that quite a bit. Those are what I hang the arguments around LGBTI human rights and development on, is human dignity and human rights. Um, even there, there's some confusion. Some people say, well, you know, why should these people get special rights? Nobody's talking about special rights. We're talking about the same rights that everyone should be entitled to. There isn't any such thing as gay rights, as far as I'm concerned. But we would be foolish to pretend that the debate over values doesn't exist. Instead, I think that's an important debate to have because it really brings us to the place where we really have to make a decision about human dignity itself. One of the challenges, of course, is to evaluate when we say human rights, that's a kind of a throwaway term. What do we mean? Are we going to go through all 30 articles of the Universal Declaration? Um, this comes up critically in development circles because we have to evaluate. We have to structure programs. We have to, to create evaluation tools that allow us to see to what extent programming and research relate to the, the specific human rights standards and principles that we're talking about. And I would call your attention to what Amartya Sen, who's a Nobel laureate, an economist and a philosopher, has done in terms of creating a shortcut, if you will, to all 30 articles and what he calls the, the seven freedoms. You can, you can find this without too much trouble. But if you look through that list, it's a freedom from in each case, but there's also an attached for quality. And I would assert to you that every single one of those freedoms from and, and for has direct relevance to LGBTI people, starting with, of course, discrimination. But you can see on there there's repression as well. There's fear there as well. There's the sense of being thwarted in your self-realization. And people who are this excluded and this stigmatized and this discriminated against have precious little chance of creating lives that are meaningful, that are productive, that are able to be a part of any particular society. 
This is the World Bank. So there is a question, of course, about, well, what about economic growth? Is this a population that matters in terms of economic growth? And there has been work done right now. You'll see the, the report done on, on the case study in India is a good example and sets a really strong precedent for how this kind of a study can be done in countries around the world right now. And the results are pretty dramatic. There is a very important footprint for LGBTI people that you know they are their exclusion damages the development of a country. These are people that could be very productive and very much a central part of what we're all trying to do, and that is a universal effort towards development, towards human flourishing. You'll notice I've also posted a, a quote there from the president of the 70th session of the UNGA, who again calls out this loss, this you know, this essentially elimination of, of a great potential that by simply discrimination that we're, we're losing something very important in terms of a development resource. Okay, I'm somebody who works in LGBTI all the time. It is my community. I'm very open about that. But for many people, this is a very confusing concept. This is a challenge. So one of the things that we really need to be quickly getting to is to get over the confusion. And I would ask you to, in your own time, look at glossaries. There are many available now so that the terminology isn't so daunting. Obviously, the, you know, there, there are a lot of terms that people would not be used to all the time who don't work in this space. They're important. The semantics really are important. So the first place to start is to get to a level of comfort around what these different terms mean. You, I've already been making reference to LGBTI and, and sometimes Q. There's also SOGI. You'll hear that expression used a lot. Sexual orientation, gender identity. Often we add the E, which is gender expression, which may have nothing to do with being homosexual or transgender. It may be that's just the way you express yourself. You may be a man who other people see you as effeminate, but that is just how you express yourself. Similarly, you may be a woman who people feel are, is, is very masculine in the way she presents herself. So what? It's just the way that she is. On this slide, I think if there's anything I would really like you to remember, those of you who are new to this topic, is being LGBT or I is not a choice. This is something that the science is extremely clear on, abundantly clear on. This is how people are born. It's, it's like arguing somebody shouldn't have blue eyes. I mean, it's simply the way people are. You don't choose to become lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or intersex. It isn't an applied lifestyle. There's nothing uniquely Western about this. This is, a, this is everywhere, every country, and has been for a very long time. So what do we want? What do LGBTI people want? Well, what's the voices saying when it comes to development needs? And I'm going to try to quickly summarize these in a, in a few slides. But I've already made reference to this before. The most important starting point is to stay alive. We, we can't have a development conversation if we can't talk about safety and security. And that's the reality for most LGBTI people right now. They are struggling to stay safe. They are so, so persecuted, and the violence sometimes is, is, is extreme. Once you get to a place of safety, then these are people that want their voices heard. And for us to be able to reach partnerships with them, to, to work with them and their development needs, means that those partnerships have to be established. The voices of the LGBTI people on the ground need to be really important. They need to be integral to the work that's being done, to the programming that's being designed. And again, we need to unpack the letters. We, we, make, we need to make sure that any programming we do is sensitive to the different needs of the different populations that are in there. This, of course, is not just for LGBTI people themselves. The way that LGBTI people have any chance at all, remember this is a small population, the way that our population has any real chance at all of being able to achieve development goals is by finding allies, finding people that are willing to say, yes, this is a human rights issue, this is an important issue about human dignity, this makes sense to me, these people need to be supported. And those people we often call allies those are people that need to be cultivated and supported and not, not prosecuted as promoters. That's an absurd notion. We have in this country and in Europe what's known as the contact theory. 
And that is simple. It's as simple as a, a fancy name for a simple fact. But when you get to know somebody who's LGBT or I, they stop being a stereotype. They become a real flesh and blood, blood person. They become Uncle Uncle Fred. They're not you know, something to be afraid of. They're just a human being like any one of the rest of us. Okay, for LGBTI people to engage in society, we, like anybody in society, need a framework of justice, of fairness, of, of equity, of rule of law. And right now, that doesn't exist. In many countries, being homosexual is, is, is criminalized, and sometimes severely so. In other places, and in actually as many places, transgender people, those are people who are born in essentially the wrong body. There's, there's a long discussion about that. But people that come to an awareness in their lives that they really are not the gender that was assigned to them at birth, they have a real challenge in getting that identity recognized in a way that they can become legal and economic participants in society. Right now, that's impossible for many of them. They simply be, become non-persons because their identity documents don't align with what they look like and who they say they are. And in many, many countries, the chance to organize, to be structured as civil society is not made available to LGBTI people. They're expressly prohibited from, from organizing. So that's a huge challenge for them as well. I've listed access to health services as important. The, I'm not just talking about health services that we often think about, HIV, AIDS, and, and sexually transmitted diseases, which of course a lot of money is being invested in. I'm talking about the LGBTI person who has a sore throat <laughs> and wants to go to see a doctor. There's no way. You go in there, you're going to be so harangued and discriminated and abused and made fun of and humiliated. It's simply not worth it. Right now, many LGBTI people do not get any health care because of that. And for some people, particularly the transgender people, getting quality health care is critical for them because they, they have very particular health needs in terms of gender transition that really cannot be done on your own. You need to get somebody to, who knows that to monitor and, and support you in that. There's other areas that we need access to. And of course, education and employment are obvious ones. And they're they're well noted by their absence amongst LGBTI people. Many LGBTI people are illiterate, so their chances of getting any kind of employment are next to nil. But even the ones that do stay in schools face terrible extremes of bullying and have a really horrible experience as, as, a, as a student. Ultimately, the environment itself has to change. We have to create a, a society that is more than tolerant that actually accepts the human dignity of all persons. And stigma itself has to then to go away. It's, it's going to take time. But only in that case will we start seeing the end of such things as being a political scapegoat for politicians. Who, it's so easy to blame everything on LGBTI people who are so vulnerable and so, so innocent in so many ways. It's, it's like an easy target, essentially. Um, ultimately, of course, we, we would like the same respect for our relationships as, as happens in other countries, and progressively so. Even in my own country, the United States, we now have same-sex marriage. But remember, I started talking about staying alive. So the, the agenda for same-sex marriage is down the road for many people, but it's on the list, and it's an important thing to be on the list as well. There's many dimensions in public policy where we need to make sure that the, the needs of this population are, are considered. Finally, the, you know, capacity strengthening is something that we have in all dimensions of civil society. There's nothing new about this dimension of, of development work. What we're asking for right now is that the resources, the experience, the skills that have come from 40 years of doing this kind of work be turned to become accessible to LGBTI organizations. There's a lot of routine capacity building needs that are there. We need access to those skills and those resources. Okay, there is a certain degree of pushback, and I would be irresponsible if I pretended it wasn't there. Uh, I've listed some of the obvious concerns that people are, are stating routinely about this, and the two first ones that are listed there. 
the fact that this is, you know, there are so many needs, there's so many demands on such scarce resources, why should this particular group get so much publicity, so much attention? The answer is relatively straightforward. When you look at the needs of those who are farthest below the threshold of human dignity, you have a chance to make a very powerful statement about humanity itself. And what could be more important in the context of international development than that we uphold the human dignity of every person? That's where we're at with LGBTI people. They are at the very bottom, of, well below the threshold of what we might consider human dignity. So I would argue they are certainly not a low priority. We need to at least get them like other people above that threshold and then we can start working on the more standard challenges of poverty alleviation. But right now, we're, we're talking again about people who need to stay alive to begin with. The issue of whether these people are relevant to economic growth, I think I've already addressed that. Um, it's an instrumental challenge. In a sense, people, you know, we, development exists not to build strong economies. <laughs> development exists for human flourishing. And strong economies are instrumental to that. But people's ability to live full and meaningful lives is what's at issue here. There are other concerns that are really important to draw your attention to. The fact that right now most of the funding in the space goes for alleviating or responding to critical emergencies. This is valuable work and I've been involved in it directly for, for a long time. But this just keeps cycling through again and again until we change the enabling environment for, which give, gives rise to these, these emergencies which you know, allows impunity for those who commit this sense of these, these violations, these emergencies will not stop. So there's a really important connection here to make with development, to changing the environment itself. One of our biggest challenges right now is there's almost no reliable data. There's, there's early beginnings of, of, you know, chances, of ways of addressing that, but so much needs to be done right now to create a, a data resource that we can use to build our programming and evaluations on. There's also the particular, and I think you know, it's a very, very topical issue right now, of LGBTI people who are part of this global refugee and asylum seeker crisis. That too is really important. Some of the other pushbacks, um, I haven't got the time right now at the, the space to really go into the challenges of faith-based organizations, except to go back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and to argue the secular dimensions of development work. And we, we ground all development work on the secular arguments that we can make in any society. Um, there's other concerns, certainly transgender and intersex people, part of the LGBTI continuum are often completely invisible. We talk about people as if everyone is gay. Many transgender people are not homosexual. They have their own lives. They, they live as men and women, and many of them identify as heterosexual. That completely gets lost in a lot of this discussion. Um, transgender men, we almost never hear about. And of course, we have a, a sort of very stigmatized population called transgender sex workers. They're the ones, that's their only way of surviving but it's easy to, to discriminate against them because of that. There's the challenge, of course, that some people simply say, male and female, those two categories don't work. That's, that's a longer discussion, but it's an important discussion and something that all societies are going to have to grow into. We also have the issue of different ways of culturally accommodating LGBTI people, and I've listed some there. Um, again, these are something we can talk about in the Q&A session. Very quickly, I'm just going to put up some, some examples of the fact that programming in this space has already begun, and there's some really good programs here. I would draw your particular attention to the survey that was done back in 2011, which is a comprehensive view of the reality faced by transgender people in this country. I would also call your attention to the work that USAID has done in combination with the National Gay and Lesbian Chamber of Commerce that is very, very integrated with economic development pursuits and is a great example of what can be done, in this case in the three countries, Mexico, Colombia, and Peru, and not a small budget there, that's a, that's a good budget. The LGBT Global Development Partnership has multiple donors to that, a very significant budget. It's, it's coming to a good close this year, but it's a really good project and you want to see examples of what can be done. There's also a whole suite of programs that have been done in Asia, led by the UNDP, but with USAID and UNESCO support 
and, and right now there's four country papers that have been published. Um, this is a really great example of the whole dimension of development approaches that can be taken. Time is up. Let me finish with just three takeaways. And certainly the one that what is most important, I think, for you to remember is that we're not talking about a special group here. We're simply talking about human dignity being a universal aspiration and expectation, human rights being apl apl applicable to everybody. We also need to be understanding that LGBTI exclusion and prosecution, sorry, persecution, needs to be handled comprehensively. We can't continue just to put band-aids on the emergencies. It's time for societies to change, to adjust. Last but not least, this is critical. The lives of LGBTI people right now are, are desperate in many cases and certainly far from being fulfilled in, in almost all cases. So the work, the investment, the focus of attention needs to change and needs to be here right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chloe. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I, again, definitely when, I mean, during your presentation, it became very clear that um, these types of exclusion, the way exclusion is playing out, and the way um, human rights and, and dignity are, are not simply available to some of these populations, has, may have strong links with access to market services and spaces. And this is something that, um, in terms of the World Bank's work and social inclusion, it's very important. So uh, thank you so much for a great presentation. And it's time for us to take um, a short poll. And in the meantime, also, you can think about questions to, to ask Chloe. You can also ask me questions. And I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Maria Beatriz <laughs> Orlando. I'm a lead social specialist at the World Bank. And I'm working on LGBTI inclusion, gender, um, ethnic minorities and, and social inclusion more generally, as well as, as poverty and social impact analysis. So you can ask questions to Chloe, and also if you have questions about the World Bank and how we're trying to approach this issue, please feel free to ask me as well. So uh, for our poll, we have our first question. Should the issue of institutionalized discrimination against marginalized minorities be a priority for all international development agencies? And wow, I think overwhelmingly <laughs> everyone is, is saying definitely as such discrimination has negative implications across very many aspects of development. Okay, now if you, we go to our second question. Wow. <laughs> so question number two, when it comes to the treatment of sexual minorities, LGBTI, should human rights, as described in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, take precedence over local culture or traditional family values? And our audience overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly says, yes, definitely, universal means universal. So um, universal human rights have no qualification. Um, for our last question, is it appropriate to compare the struggle by LGBTI persons for their human rights and dignity with the struggle for gender equity and women's rights that, um, that I guess uh, is a little bit older in terms of human history. And all of you said, again, this is a very, um, I think, a very uh, like-minded uh, audience. Everyone says definitely. For even though women are not a minority, uh, they also suffer from a long history mm -hmm. of marginalization, discrimination, solidarity across and between these struggles is paramount. So essentially, there is a lot we can learn, I think, from the struggle to bring uh, gender equity and women's rights to the international development agenda, and, and maybe we can apply some of these lessons now. Some of you are saying yes in general terms, but when it comes to the details, the two categories are fundamentally different. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for participating in the poll. And right now we have some minutes for questions and answers. So please, um, please feel free to ask your questions. And a lot of you have been asking for the presentation. Mm -hmm. And uh, Prati mentioned in our team that it will be definitely available online, uh, as all our presentations in the social inclusion series are. And also, we will have the video of, uh, with the full presentation and a podcast as well. So let's see if we have any other questions. So um, while you, you think about questions, we did get some questions in advance. 
who are really absolutely fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're going to start with those um, since they, again, they were sent a few days ago by the audience. So the first question is by uh, Jenny Jarabek, um, especially regarding implementation of LGBTI programs for us as an NGO who works in the disability sector. The question is how I can mainstream this topic in an intercultural sensitive way with our partners from Ethiopia, Mozambique, Burkina Faso, Bolivia, etc. What are the entry points on how to discuss this important matter with project partners that generally develop projects around health and CBR, community-based rehabilitation and inclusive education? So how do you bring in with, with partners? I think the, this is a great question, Jenny, and thank you very much. I think one of the most important ways to begin to frame the answer to this question is to think about people as whole human beings, not as just a you know, disaggregated, this person's only concerned about this set of issues, but to look at them as a whole person. And of course, when it comes to, to bridging across, in, in this case, persons with disabilities, for instance, and those in the LGBTI community, this may not seem obvious at first until you think about what I mentioned in, earlier in, the, in the, the webinar, that both of these populations really huddle together quite low below that threshold of human dignity. Both are in a situation of being largely hidden, hard to find out about, hard to access, hard to get data about. Um, so there's a, a lot of similarities in terms of the challenges that both of these populations face. Both of these populations have a great deal of struggle reaching out from the places where they are to access public services, to be able to get jobs, to be able to get education, health services, etc. Also, this is a situation where you know both of these populations are often in overlap. So you could be a, a person with disabilities who's also a lesbian. There's intersectionality here at play. And why would we only choose to look at one dimension of that? We need to look at the whole person. In both cases, both of these populations face pervasive human rights violations. And that's, again, something to raise to people's understanding that why would anybody, why would it be okay in any society for people in that society to be denied their human rights you know, claims and protections. And putting that question on those who would wish to deny them that is a really important way of framing this. It's not for us to bang them over the head and say, we insist that you give these people human rights. It's actually a more useful way to frame this to say, why aren't you giving these people in your population access to their basic human rights that every human being deserves? Certainly last, just to conclude this, last but not least, Nobody chooses to be marginalized. This is not something that people have any choice about. If you're born with disabilities, you're born with disabilities. Same if you're LGBTI. Um, not that I'm <laughs> aligning this with disabilities, but in both cases, these are these are dimensions of a person's personality that often get, per, you know, called out as something to discriminate against them on. Thank you so much, Chloe. Um, the question reminded me of an event we had last week um, that was about stigma that both LGBTI populations and, and, and people with disabilities faced in the labor market. And uh, we may be able to circulate those materials as well. Okay. I think we, we need to circulate those, those presentations and papers. This is research from the United States. But essentially, the issue of stigma, of essentially um, being judged um, in the labor market even before your resume is, is being read is common for these populations as well. So we also received another question, um, this time from Fiji, um, Ms. Sulik uh, Waka. Uh, Fiji has constitutional protection on grounds of SOGI in the 2013 Fiji Constitution. Just recently, a transgender person seeking legal gender recognition in Fiji's High Court had her case dismissed. What are some mechanisms to put in place to ensure that implementation of protection on grounds of SOGI is fulfilled and realized? Wow, this is a tough one. Um, it's very personal for me, and I'm, I'll, I'll answer this as, as Chloe, not as the World Bank, but um, I'm openly transgender myself. So when I hear about this woman's case, and I, I've heard about this case, it's, it's well known around the world, which is, again is, you know, you question why Fiji would want to be known for this, this travesty of justice, which it truly is. This is a woman who, for more than nine years, has lived her life as her authentic gender identity as a woman. Um, this is a country with a constitution that 
makes it possible for that recognition to be offered. And here we have the Suva High Court saying no. Um, simply saying that it's not in my department. That's a very old excuse. It's simply not acceptable. So we have a lot of challenges here in education and getting people to understand that transgender is a hard topic for many people. People who express a gender identity that is not what society has listed them with at the time of their birth really confuse people. And people push back and say, well, wait a minute, you know, you, you can't decide that yourself. Well, I can tell you, you can. There's a very clear sense deep inside of who you are, and transgender people would not do what they do, what we do, if, if we didn't have to do it. This is not a choice for us either. It's our only way of really staying alive. This woman's case was so badly treated, the way that even the court itself and the media addressed her using male pronouns is so disrespectful and so coming from such a place of ignorance and possibly from fear as well. Um, it all needs to be revisited. This is a case that needs to be called out for what it is, a travesty of justice. This, and we need to remember that this is a human being. This is a person who's claiming a fundamental attribute. She's claiming that this is who I am. And if that cannot even be recognized, we have to question what the rule of law is all about in a situation like that. This is a person that's not asking for any special privileges. She's simply asking to be recognized. So I know it's hard for many people to understand. I mean, all I can say, say is, how would you feel if you were constantly called the wrong pronoun yourself? If you're a man and you were always referred to as a woman, you would feel pretty uncomfortable about that. And that's just a tiny sense of what it's like if you're transgender and you're not respected for your authentic gender. Thank you. Thank you. For, we have many questions now. So <laughs> can I just go to the next question by uh, Kay Wilkinson. How to support communities and activists effectively in locations where political homophobia is prevalent? A great question again. Thank you. You guys are great with questions. <laughs> um, this is a really great question in the sense that this happens all the time. And people, again, I mentioned that this population is often very hidden and hard to access. And who are we who are, you know, I'm talking about people who are in the development community but may, may not be in the LGBTI community. How do we support them? How do we connect with them? The place is, it, it begins with having a relationship and a relationship built on trust. So we, you cannot speak for LGBTI people. They need to speak for themselves. Every culture, every context is different. The most important thing you can do in the development context is get connected with these people. Understand them. Allow them to be center in terms of saying what their needs are, what their aspirations are, and having them have a very, very central voice in the design of programming that they need to achieve the kind of development goals we all want. That's the most important thing. They are there. They will tell you what, what they're up against. They will also tell you where they see opportunity spaces. They will give really good advice about how to get the message out about their basic humanity, um, they will give you a very strong idea of what, who, who and what you're up against, but they'll also give you a, a real window of where you can actually make some progress. So work with them. That's the best way. Great. So now we, uh, our next question mentions uh, actually a very positive example, which is the example of Nepal. And the question comes from Gaurav Kandel. Thank you so much for your participation. How do you see Nepal as an example, uh, as a progressive outcome, being the only country that has both Soji mentioned in the Constitution, uh, other than South Africa and Ecuador, and other category on their gender on the passport and, and citizenship, I imagine, um, the citizenship identification card. Thank you. This is, a good, again, a good question. Um, and it's certainly worth calling out with some <clears throat> considerable appreciation the, the model, the leadership, really, that's been shown by Nepal in this particular context. Uh, while not wishing to diminish that in any sense, I would argue, though, that it's although having a constitutional provision for respecting the, the human rights of LGBTI people is, is critical, it takes more than that. We can't change a society by just simply changing a constitution. Additional work needs to be done, and that we can't just hope that that happens. We have to make sure that that's actually structured into the way people are educated, the way their sensitivity is raised to these issues. Um, I mean, an example of that, for instance, is the fact that 
Nepal has created a space for someone to declare that their gender is neither male or female, but that they wish to be known in an other category, a third category, a third gender, if you will. For some people, that works. But for many transgender people, they want to be known as a man or a woman. And right now, even in Nepal, that option is not open to them. If they were born in a man's body and have lived the rest of their lives as a woman, they cannot be recognized as a woman even now. So even though this is a great start, there's still important work to be done. Similar situations apply in Pakistan, India, other places where third gender is, is certainly an op you know, it exists in, in, a, in a certain levels within the law and within society, but it's not an answer for everyone. Thank you. So with this, I'm going to turn into um, another um, type of questions, which um, come from colleagues working uh, in international development and are asking us um, how can we act from, from uh, each one of our respective institutions. So uh, one question comes from Anthony Cotton from USAID. Um, and he says, um, I find, I'm, I'm trying to summarize the question, I find sometimes, um, I find myself preaching to the choir, or that we are preaching to the choir. In your experience, Chloe, what are the best ways to ensure that we start to change the hearts and minds of people, both those in the United States and abroad, who are not LGBTI or allies, but rather somewhere between openly antagonistic and cautiously tolerant on LGBTI issues. And there was another question on tolerance versus yeah. inclusion, which you can probably merge okay. into this as well. Um, so uh, that comes um, from one of, our, one of our colleagues. Thank you so much. Uh, there's another question uh, that is related uh, from Patricia Vondal. Um, in terms of international development programming to include LGBTI e economic actors, how does one identify these groups in order to include them? I guess this question is a bit more operational. It's like, sure. once on the ground, what are some good strategies okay. for identification? All right, well, that's great. Thanks both to, to Anthony and Pat, both I know very well, and I appreciate the work that you're both doing in development. You're doing a really important piece of work here. Um, <laughs> Anthony, your question is an important one because we often do speak within ourselves. And this is more the case, I think, particularly within the activist community, but it applies in development, the development space as well. Um, there's a relatively easy way to solve that, and that is to begin the conversation in the forum of social justice. And there's many, many times where people are called together who are not specifically LGBTI focused, but around social justice issues and, of course, human rights issues as well. You will find people in those spaces that are focused on gender equity, for instance, on, on workplace you know, discrimination issues, etc. That's a place to introduce the consciousness that there is another population here that shares similar concerns. Um, we are often reticent and, and sometimes fearful to introduce this, but just simply having them in the room, getting a chance for people who are working in the space anyway to recognize LGBTI persons as their allies in the same struggle for social justice and human rights allows us to broaden the conversation, to get this to become less stigmatized, less stereotyped, and actually see ourselves in a bigger solidarity here around human flourishing, around human development. Pat, your question is, is can you repeat it again? So it's a little bit about identification strategies. And strategies sure. from I think it's, it's a more operational question. Yeah. It's about given that this is a hidden population because of right. all the violence and stigma. Um, how can one, um, from the point of view of programming, apply successful strategies to identify these groups so we can effectively target them, include right. them, reach out to them? We need we need data. I mean, there's no no way no two ways around this. We need to get some reliable dependable data, there are really good techniques now available that we can do this. Look at techniques like respondent-driven sampling, uh, ways of actually getting access to these people in terms of, you know, overcoming the bias that would come by simply asking one to recommend another, who then in turn recommends another. But we need to find data that we can feel some confidence about represents the totality of this particular marginalized population. It's not cheap. Data is always a significant investment. We need to do that, though. And of course, there's always the need to engage in conversation, which we all should be good at if we're in the development world. It's not hard to find LGBTI people in the activist community. 
um, they, that's their mission is to make their their humanity known to others. And they, once you've established a trusting relationship, and I can't emphasize that enough, these are people that are often threatened with extreme violence. So they have a reason to demand a certain level of trust. But once you can establish that trust and put aside the time to make that happen, you have a real opportunity to, to become very well acquainted. <laughs> I've, I've become so well connected to my LGBTI colleagues and friends in Uganda, for instance. I, I've gotten to know a few and now I know them all, it feels like. And they're just such a, a tremendous group of people and have taught me so much. So it's once you build these relationships, you can you can build on them, and that's really important. And I think just to add, um, there are other questions. Uh, one great question from uh, Aline Magnoni: uh, What are the main avenues for for research? And and definitely data. Just yeah. to emphasize what you just said, I think I would just like to tie to that that question to your answer, which sure. is that data is crucial yeah. in this space um, for. I think from both um, the, the human rights uh, activism perspective, but also from a development perspective. Yeah. Now, um, when it comes to data collection, I think one of our uh, crucial next steps as a community is also to develop um, ethic guidelines yeah. and human subjects um, right. guidelines, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, these are populations that are subject to to violence and threats, yeah. and we don't want to further exposure expose them or put populations at risk. So I think. In these spaces, and, and, and on this I see a similarity with gender-based violence, mm -hmm. um, where it took us a few years to, to have these protocols in yeah. place. They're also very context-specific, so this I see as, as one um, very good step for us as, as a community. And I'll take the opportunity to, to for a small commercial. Um, <laughs> the World Bank and the International Center for Research on Women um, just recently published um, uh, a guide on gu several briefs and guides on gender-based violence, uh, and they're sectoral. They're for the transport sector, the health sector, etc. And one of them is um, a brief on violence against uh, LBT women. And I was offered by Jennifer McCleary Seals, who's joining us today and has already offered the, the resource on, online. Uh, but again, I mean, in, in, even in this guide, it's always the main concern is data, where we really need to expand on, on this. There's a question here for the World Bank uh, from, from Lee Badgett, who's uh, another pioneer um, uh, on research and, and the main author of the India report. What do we know about how well LGBTI LGBTI groups are incorporated into World Bank programs. Well, we took stock, um, and this is from the World Bank's perspective, we, we, we did a little bit of a stock take. And of course, most of our activities are in the, in the health sector uh, and HIV AIDS programs. Right. Now, having said that, there have been, um, I think, good um, different programs and a, a good variety of programs from which we can learn and can apply some lessons learned to other programs uh, uh, in education, anti-bullying campaigns, um, access to justice, access to labor markets. So we're in that process of um, learning a little bit more from uh, whatever the bank has done already uh, in the space of HIV AIDS and trying to apply it to, to other sectors. Clearly, lots of scope for work. Um, a lot of our activities in other sectors besides HIV AIDS have been small or funded by grants. Uh, and again, we're trying to um, scale them up and learn and, and apply some of, some of the lessons. Um, let, me, let me just offer a yes. comment on that too. And Please. I think one of the things we really need right now at this stage are some effective frameworks to do the evaluation, to, to structure the research that we need to do. Uh, and there's a lot of work going on right now in this space. I, I would call attention to the work that USAID is doing to create analytical frameworks to, to structure this research on. I would also call attention to the organization World Learning, who built a collaboration amongst a whole variety of, of international development practitioners to create a consensus on what these frameworks might look like. I would also call attention to the framework I put up here, the Amartya Sen Seven Freedoms Framework. Between all of these, we have many, many ways to begin the research agenda, and it's an important agenda. But your your comment about the ethical concerns cannot be stated strongly enough. These are this is a population who. Vulnerability is enormous, and we have to be so sensitive to making sure that we do not expose them to additional threats of violence and insecurity. So that caution needs to be built in all the time. 
Joy, thank you so much. We have only two minutes left. Uh, thanks to all the participants for the questions. We will try to post online, online as, as many resources and as much material as possible. Uh, but again, uh, thank you so much for participating. And thank you, Chloe, for a brilliant presentation and a great discussion you. and, and your answers. I mean, clearly reflecting many years of work on this issue. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, just uh, to conclude, we have uh, available for you some feedback, a feedback form. Please fill it out so we can learn about what uh, worked well and things that we can do better. Thank you so much again.